Up until the year 1886, the only way to cross the River Mersey was by one of the many Mersey ferries. But on the 1st of February 1886, the Mersey Railway had opened to the public. There had been many attempts to build links before. The earliest one by none other than Isambard Kingdom Brunel's father, Mark Brunel, who proposed a road tunnel. One of the first railway plans was by the Chester and Birkenhead Railway of 1840. Another ambitious plan was to tunnel under the Mersey then bridge over the Dee. This was John Hawkshaw's North Wales Railway, but these plans came to nothing. As did ambitious plans for bridges such as the Birkenhead and Liverpool Junction Railway, who wanted to build a bridge linking the Chester to Birkenhead line with the Liverpool and Garston line. The Mersey Railway's journey from conception to opening was also littered with false starts. In 1866 the first bill to pass through Parliament was the Mersey Pneumatic Railway. This envisioned trains, if you can call them that, being blown by pneumatic pressure from Liverpool to Wirral and vice versa. The technologies involved in this propulsion method certainly worked on a very small scale, but would certainly limit passenger capacity. It was dropped by 1871 in favour of a normal conventional railway. This plans and sections map that was presented to Parliament, shows what the line would have been like. Starting at the junction of Lord Street, it would pass under the Mersey and have terminated at Woodside. The following year the promoters went back to Parliament to change the bill to a conventional railway, and extend it to near Liverpool Central. Rejected proposals were to have the terminus sited at Whitechapel. More bills followed, and more time passed. By 1872 the route of the line was from Church Street to a point near Green Lane. Work by the company had commenced in 1872 with the digging of shafts at Shaw Road and Man Island. This proved the rock to be sound, but the contractor suffered financial troubles and the work stopped. Frustrated by the lack of progress the landowners, the dock board, tipped spoil into the holes. Continued attempts to raise money for the venture continued, alongside various boardroom disputes and resignations. Perhaps the suggestion that the line was being built as a purely speculative venture, to be taken over by a bigger company, was putting investors off. Many had lost money during the railway mania period. As things turned out they were right to be wary. One investor that thought the line was a worthy prospect was one Major Samuel Isaacs. He personally ploughed a substantial amount into the company, and allowed work to recommence. The tunnel was to be three separate headings. A ventilation heading, to extract the fumes from the locomotives. A drainage heading, to capture any influx of water. And the main double track running tunnel. As the headings progressed, it was found necessary to divert both the ventilation and drainage headings. This was due to a glacial channel on the Liverpool side of the river section. Although it was known to be there, it turned out to be far deeper than originally thought. To try to provide clearance, the drainage and ventilation headings were combined and ran alongside the main rail tunnel. Despite these efforts, a length of 66 yards of the top of the rail tunnel broke through the rock cover and into the silt of the river bed. Carefully dug by hand, this section proved to be one of the driest of the whole tunnel. At certain parts of the rail tunnel, access was provided into the combined drainage and ventilation heading. One is seen here, the water flowing down to one of the sumps at Man Island or Shore Road. All the headings were driven from either the Liverpool or Birkenhead shafts. Whilst the Liverpool heading was driven conventionally, the one from Birkenhead used the Beaumont boring machine. This machine was the forerunner of today's tunnel boring machines. Sadly the machine produced very fine rock dust particles that the operators breathed in, and led to their early demise due to silicosis. Whilst the river tunnel was being dug, the ever-ambitious Mersey Railway were back in Parliament with plans for extensions somewhere to come to fruition, such as from Green Lane to Rock Ferry, and Hamilton Square to Birkenhead Park. But others were to be eventually abandoned. One was to be a line from the park branch to the docks at Birkenhead. This short heading would have been the start of this branch. Two other abandoned short headings, at Man Island, would have linked the Mersey line to the docks in Liverpool. One of these headings was eventually to see use as the start of the Mersey Railway terminal loop of the 1970s. The other remains abandoned to this day. As tunnelling work continued, the design of the locomotives to run the services was also underway. The locomotive manufacturers, Bayer Peacock, came up with a powerful design, able to cope with the steep gradients of the river tunnel. The first nine were 064 tank locomotives, with condensing apparatus that was supposed to consume their own smoke, these were followed by six 262 tanks. 
and a follow-on order by Kitson of a further three, two six two tanks all with the same condensing apparatus. The method of transporting passengers up and down to the deep level platforms at both James Street and Hamilton Square was to be by hydraulically powered lifts. Each station had three sets of these spacious lifts, capable of transporting 100 passengers at a time. They acquired the nickname of flying ballrooms due to their size. Also provided at both stations are stairways up to booking hall level. At James Street, a second station entrance was provided at Water Street and descended to the platforms via a very steep walkway. A similar walkway was also built at Hamilton Square, where it climbs up to this anonymous exit in Shaw Road. It is still retained, as can be seen here, but only for emergency use. As tunneling proceeded, the constant influx of water was dealt with by the pumps at Man Island and Shaw Road. Approximately 4,000 gallons an hour enter the tunnel. This was to rise to 7,000 gallons during construction. Though this is nothing compared to the Great Western Railway's 7 tunnel, also under construction at the same time. Their excavations broke into an underground spring resulting in the entire tunnel being flooded. Pumps capable of extracting 40,000 gallons an hour were needed there. Although the pumping of the water out of the Mersey Tunnel was absolutely necessary, the operation did require expensive pumps and the coal and manpower to operate them. Other drains on the company were the operation of the fans and lifts. All needed, but none brought income to the new company. The breakthrough of the river tunnel finally came on 17 January 1884 and dignitaries were able to pass under the Mersey for the very first time from Liverpool to Birkenhead. As work progressed steadily, plans for the grand opening were being thought out. His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales train was to arrive at Birkenhead at 11.40am. Passing over to the Mersey Railway to Birkenhead Central and meet the company chairman and directors. Then it was on to Hamilton Square to inspect the fans and machinery, before a trip under the river to James Street for more inspections. Where after speeches, the railway was officially declared open at 1.30pm on 20 January 1886. Public services then commenced from James Street to Green Lane Station on 1 February. Calling at Hamilton Square and Birkenhead Central. The temporary Liverpool terminus at James Street, with its wide platform and high-vaulted tunnel roof, certainly gave it a spacious air. But with the intense use of the powerful locomotives, that air soon turned foul. The street-level buildings matching those at Hamilton Square. At Hamilton Square, the large hydraulic tower still remains. This rail level view clearly shows the wide and high station extent, with three of the ventilation shafts visible in the tunnel crown. Although not as busy as it used to be, Green Lane Station was well appointed for its albeit temporary role as the Mersey Railway Terminus. The booking hall being on a grand scale for what was to become a through station. The half-covered platforms, with strengthening beams to support the joint lines up above, are shorter than the rest of the Mersey stations. A ventilation shaft was situated in the mouth of the tunnel towards Birkenhead Central. Its outlet being this triangular-shaped chimney attached to the main station building, situated on the junction of Old Chester Road and Green Lane. Birkenhead Central was to be the company headquarters. The station buildings here were also to a grand design for such a small company and incorporated their main offices. This platform bridge being particularly ornate. Situated alongside the station was the loco and maintenance shed. The extension of the line towards Birkenhead Park was opened on the 2nd of January 1888. It was here that the Mersey locomotives terminated. The connection to Rock Ferry opened on 15 June 1891. The Mersey trains terminating in the bay platforms, whilst those from Woodside to Chester and beyond used the through platforms.
and the final section to the Cheshire Lines Liverpool Central, opened on the 11th of January 1892. The approach to Central was laid out, in typical Mersey railway style, to be easily enlarged to four platforms. But it was only ever one island platform. The unfinished heading seen here. Signal boxes were provided at appropriate places such as here at Birkenhead Central and this one at James Street. Whilst manning the boxes was no doubt unpleasant during steam days. One box, known as Riverbed, located mid-river, must have been truly horrendous to work in. Its remains are seen here. Not long after opening it was soon apparent that things weren't going well for the company. Despite the locomotives being designed to consume their own smoke, they proved ineffective. But worse was the ventilation system. Despite the extraction fans being in constant use, they failed to fully remove the smoke. The foul atmosphere built up to such an extent, that passengers deserted the railway in favour of the ferries. This satirical cartoon of the time, depicts investors' money being poured down the drain that was the Mersey Railway. However, the engineering achievement of the line's engineers, Charles Douglas Fox and James Brunleys, should not be underestimated. But with falling passenger income and the extra running costs of the pumps, fans and lifts, the new railway was plunged into bankruptcy. The only hope of salvation was for the line to be converted to electric traction. But how was a bankrupt line to raise the finance for such a venture? Well, that's another story. <laughs>